Dr. Yebu, wow. It did kind of jump off the page when I saw that student review. Doesn't that sound like a mad scientist name? Dr. Yebu. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about behavioral finance and policy-based financial planning within the context of behavioral finance, as, as Jennifer said. And it's interesting, I mean, there's a couple of themes that have been running through, through this conference. Obviously, behavioral finance is one of them. Uh, you know, we started out with our first morning hearing a lot about that. In this same room at 3.15 today, there's going to be a session that's titled Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, I think we're all taking that off of Daniel, the title of Daniel Kahneman's book. So it's, a, um, you know, it's an important topic. It's one that seems to, be, seems to have finally seeped into sort of every corner of financial planning. And it's a really interesting time because you know, we've been talking about behavioral finance for some years now. And there's been a significant focus on the, the, the heuristics, the mental biases, and you know, the cognitive errors. And... Uh, to a significant degree, that was the focus. And I'm sure you all remember early on when, when people were looking at behavioral finance, they were saying, well, look, this challenges the notion of a rational agent in financial markets. Modern portfolio theory must be dead, which I really don't think it is. Um, but we've reached a point now where we're finally starting to see that we can develop tools based on the insights of behavioral finance. Amy Mullen had a presentation yesterday in which she was doing that very thing, talking about systems and tools that could... That could uh, sort of harness what we've learned through behavioral finance and use it to engage clients in a way that affects positive change in their lives. So this is, this is uh, one more little entry in that particular category. These are some of the books that, that I suspect most of you have probably read these, but if you haven't, they're really good. Thaler and Sunstein's book, Nudge, uh, which I'm, I'm going to be referencing quite a bit today. Uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I'm going to say it even though I know you all know it. You know, won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years ago, even though he's a psychologist. You know, we're showing the Nobel Committee recognize the importance of this field. Uh, and Predictably Irrational by Daniel Ariely, uh, also a really good read on the topic. So what we're always talking about when we get into behavioral finance is the ways in which the brain has two different ways of thinking, two different systems for thinking. And depending on what sort of domain of knowledge you're, you're dipping into or, or which author or researcher you're talking to, they have different ways of naming these two domains. You know, in, in the field of psychology, they call them system one and system two. Uh, Daniel Kahneman obviously calls it you know, thinking fast and slow. Um, human versus econ, that's Thaler and Sunstein. There is, a, there is an econ, you know, that rational agent that, that we talk about in classical economics. It exists, it's just not the whole story. Um, and then bureaucracy of habits and, and, um, um, and what I'm going to call, what he calls beginner's mind, but it's uh, Stuart Heller, another psychologist I'll be referencing before I'm done. But there have been, a, this is a, something that's been addressed from a lot of different angles and with a lot of different lenses, but it's all focusing on the same thing. Human beings have two systems for thinking that operates side by side and interchangeably. The automatic system is all about fast thinking. And, you know, as we heard uh, yesterday morning, the automatic system, among other things, uh, helps us make fast decisions, helped our ancestors make fast decisions when they were worried about whether or not that movement in the grass was going to be a saber-toothed tiger or just the wind blowing. Um, you have to think fast under those circumstances if you're going to pass your, your uh, genetic heritage down to future generations. Uh, and then there's, a, there's a, the reflective system, which is the slow system. And with the passage of time, a lot of things that start out on the reflective side move to the fast side. You know, I mentioned the example here of driving a car. The reason, you know, you think about driving a car and young people have much, much higher rates of, ac of, you know, of, of uh, automobile accidents. Now, on the one hand, people point to the fact that they have, that they're younger, they have faster reaction time. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're driving with their reflective system. They're thinking about it every minute, and that makes them slow. Eventually, when we've been driving for 10 or 20 or 30 years, most of those basic driving functions have shifted over to the, to the fast side, to the automatic side. We don't even think about it. It happens at a, at liter, literally at a subconscious level. But the automatic system is fast 
because it uses shortcuts. And these shortcuts we call heuristics. These shortcuts uh, you know, also sometimes uh, are called biases, or at least they lead to biases, to cognitive errors. And uh, we've all heard of these. So these are some of the classics that were, first, that were first identified by Daniel Kahneman and others, like anchoring, availability, representativeness, loss aversion, overconfidence, mental accounting. Uh, I'll talk about these a little bit in the financial planning context, as well as a, actually as well as a few more. But I'm not. This is not. Ultimately, this is not going to be a, a, a lecture on behavioral finance for a couple of reasons. It's my greater purpose is to talk about how we can harness the insights of behavioral finance, and secondly, again, I respecting the room. I know that most of you have had a significant exposure at this conference alone and for many years before. So in the financial planning context, I know these will look familiar to you. You know, there's the availability heuristic, which is the tendency of people to make decisions or make judgment calls based on how readily they can bring to mind relevant examples. So the availability of the knowledge. And so in a financial planning context, um, you know, if, if someone can readily think about the six relatives they know that are all in their 80s, and going strong, that person you could probably talk into planning for a long retirement. Uh, someone who, I've, it, there, and this can go in two different directions. I've, I've had multiple examples of both of these. I don't want to talk to you about long-term care insurance because my mother had long-term care insurance and when I tried to collect on it to help her, the insurance company refused to pay, so forget it, it's a waste of money. And then I've had other instances where they say, oh my God, you know, my mother had LTC and thank God because we were able to get the caretakers in. So depending on what particular memories they have, they're going to tilt one way or the other, and you have to work with that as a financial planner. Uh, representativeness. We have a tendency, I mean, fast decision making means pattern recognition. And so the brain is a, is a is an, sort of, a, it's an explaining organ. It's a pattern seeking organ. And it will, it's such a pattern-seeking organ that it will see patterns when they don't exist. And we deal with this every day in financial planning. Um, by a show of hands, who here in the year 2012 had at least one client ask you how you were going to change their portfolio if Mitt Romney was elected president? Wow, actually not very many people. I'm kind of surprised that. I had several people ask me that. Um, you know, there's a tendency for people to think, and certainly if you look at the, the popular financial press, you will see lots of articles devoted to the subject of what the impact of the election is going to be on the economy and on the financial markets. And it's such a, que it's such a question of interest, of human interest, that it's actually been researched a lot. And at the end of the day, admittedly the samples are kind of small because we don't have that many elections. Um, but nonetheless, to the degree you can, you can draw any statistically significant inferences, by and large, who's in office and the results of any given election has very little impact on the economy and the, and, and the financial markets, at least in any predictable way. Maybe with, you know, 2020 hindsight, you can spot those idiosyncratic cases, but there's no systematic relationship. But everyone is convinced of patterns. Another example, I, knew, uh, a, I know of a case of a retired uh, nuclear engineer who, when we tsunami that damaged the nuclear reactor at Fukushima um, was very concerned because based on his expert knowledge of nuclear engineering, he was convinced that the damage was much, much worse than what was being reported in the press. And so he sold all of his, he sold his portfolio, went to cash, hunkered down, was convinced that there was going to be, you know, sort of massive disruptions throughout the world economy. It's true that in the immediate aftermath of, of the tsunami, you know, the financial markets did dip. But within a matter of weeks, they were actually fully recovered. This nuclear engineer was correct that the damage was, in fact, much worse than was originally reported, but he was answering the wrong question. The question wasn't, is the damage to the reactor worse than they're reporting? The, the real question was, is it going to have any impact on the financial markets and the world economy? And the answer was, you know, not a zero impact, but a, but a, fa a fairly small one, at least where the financial markets were concerned. Optimism, overconfidence, loss aversion, and anchoring. Um, 
any of, I think most of us here in this room were around long enough to have experienced the, the sort of the dot-com frenzy and the, and the dot-com meltdown and all had to deal with clients who were working for technology firms here in the Bay Area and who just knew based on their inside information, it led them to be extremely confident as an employee of the company that they knew that this company was going to do tremendously well sort of infinitely and forever into the future. Um, and that led them to the overconfidence to over, over commit the company stock and options, to hold on to them way too long. You know, Cisco for me, I, I was going to say that there were, you know, a lot of technology companies in the Bay Area, but somehow I'd gotten plugged into the Cisco network and, and so I had a lot of Cisco employees. Some of them took my advice and some of them didn't. Some of them wrote it from 90 to 9. Um, fortunately, most of them didn't. But overconfidence is, you know, this, this notion that I have some insight, some expert knowledge is something we're always dealing with. And of course, loss aversion and anchoring is another one. We have very few clients who uh, have anything other than our standard portfolio, which is composed exclusively of mutual funds. But in a few instances, someone will have some piece of stock, some position in a stock that they, that they brought in that, um, that they just they can't let go of, and they refuse to let go of. And uh, I have one instance now of someone who has a position in Apple, and I, I, I try everything under the sun to try and get rid of this thing. It's not big enough to totally destroy their lives, but it's big enough to hurt if things go bad. Um, and I see every possible expression of behavioral finance here. You know, the higher the price goes, the price at which this person is willing to sell keeps fading off into the distance. And then if the price falls, they're anchored, and they don't want to, they, so their loss of, their anchoring and their loss aversion causes them to refuse to sell as it's falling. And then as it starts to come back up again, prices that they swore they'd be willing to sell at before, they now fade off into the distance again. And it's this, it's this, it's a classic case. So I, I wish I, maybe I should write it up as a case study. So these are things, so let me just ask by a show of hands, who here has dealt with all of the things that I've mentioned? Right, everybody in the room. So that's why we're not going to spend too much more time on that because you guys have lived it, you know the theory, you've lived the, the actual practical expression of the theory. Uh, and so what, what I really want to focus on, oh, actually I want to, yeah, before I move on to policy-based financial planning itself, I want to talk a little bit more about this concept of nudges or choice architecture. Um, in, there's a, a great psychologist named Stu Heller who's, um, in presentations in the past, he has said that when you're having a conversation with a client, you're really having two conversations. The one with the client who has a specific set of ideals and goals and, and aspirations. And the second conversation is with that client's bureaucracy of habits. And what he likes to say is, habits eat change. And for him, the bureaucracy of habits is that, is that uh, system, that system two, that, you know, that automatic system that has protocols about how, th how you do things. And protocols, those fundamental protocols are hard to change. You can't push against them directly. You have to use almost a form of Aikido to leverage those existing protocols, those existing, that, that bureaucracy of habits into a new direction. And in, like Thaler and Sunstein, they're talking about biases. But th the thing I loved about their book, Nudge, is they were talking about how you could take what we know, take those biases, take those heuristics, and build decision tools around them using what they call choice architecture in order to, to actually use them as leverage to help people, to help nudge people in positive directions, in, in, in uh, beneficial directions, if you will. You notice from the title of this presentation, I didn't quite follow Thaler and Sunstein's lead in calling it what I would calling policy-based financial planning choice architecture. I called it decision architecture because we've always talked about policies as a form of decision rules. And so that one felt a little bit better to me. But this is, a, but this is where we're getting, as I said earlier, this is where we're moving into a realm now where we can take the insights of behavioral finance and actually turn them into practical tools so that we're not fighting against clients' propensities, we're sort of working with them. So, Thaler and Sunstein say that nudges are important when you're dealing with decisions that are rare, that don't happen every day, 
for which there's no prompt feedback mechanism so that people can see exactly what's happening, and where people have trouble translating the situation into circumstances that they understand, their personal experience. Daniel Pink, whoever was at the annual conference last year, Daniel Pink was speaking there, and one of his, one of his notions is that when you're dealing with people and helping them affect change in their lives, you need to give them an easy off-ramp. And what he meant by that is, again, just give them an off-ramp that is, that is consistent with their particular um, heuristics, their particular way of dealing with the world, rather than trying to fight against it. So here's an example of the power of the nudge. Now this, is, this was not given in the book nudge, uh, but I suspect many of you in the room may be familiar with it. In, in case you don't recognize your European maps, this is, a map of, of, this is a map in which I've highlighted Germany and Austria. And the, the European Social Survey was used to calculate um, a, a cultural similarity number. It's like a correlation. And the cultural similarity index for these two countries is 0.846. That's the highest cultural uh, similarity that Germany has with any other country except Luxembourg, which I think has a cultural similarity index of 0.888 or 0.882. So very, very culturally and historically, these countries could, you could take away the, the boundary, you could take away the, the, the national border, and you'd hardly know the difference when you were walking across the border. Now, if you look at it, the organ donation rate between the two countries, you'll see that it, in Austria, it's 99%, which is pretty impressive. And in Germany, it's 12%. So you look at that and say, wait a minute, these countries culturally are almost identical. They could basically be the same country. And yet, in Germany, the, 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 pardon me, in, in Austria, the organ donation rate is 99%, and in Germany, 12%. What possibly can explain that? Well, what explains it is how people actually establish themselves as organ donors or not. In Austria, it's an opt-out system, and in Germany, it's an opt-in system. You know, this is, this is an example of the status quo bias, or inertia. People are subject to inertia. People tend, not to, people tend to take the path of least resistance. And so if you have to opt out, the path of least resistance is to stay in. And if you have to opt in, the path of least resistance is to stay out. And so it's something as simple as this. A choice structure shift as simple as this can have radically dramatic effects. In this case, have a radically dramatic effect on an entire society. So Thaler and Sunstein, when they're talking about choice architecture, they basically identify six components that need to be addressed. Incentives. You have to understand what the incentive structure of the choice is. What are the incentives? Now, this could be financial incentives. I mean, classical economics comes into play. This could be financial incentives. It could be incentives related to someone's just the pleasure or utility they derive from, from making a decision. But you have to understand the incentive structure before you can begin to architect a choice structure. Understanding mapping. Mapping is the notion of understanding how a choice leads to an outcome or a series of choices lead to different outcomes. And mapping is something we do all the time as financial planners because as financial planners, we're doing, we're sort of exercising, uh, we're sort of practicing around the fundamental principle of economics. You know, when you, study, when you study economics, one of the first things you learn is the problem of economics. What is economics dealing with? It's dealing with how to allocate scarce resources in, the, in, the, in a world of, of uh, sort of infinite wants, if you will. And that's what we're dealing with. No matter how much or little resources our clients have, they can always conceive of more things they would like to do than they have the resources to, to accomplish. Bill Gates is on record with all of his billions as having more he wants to do in the world than he, can, than he actually has the resources to accomplish. The human imagination is limitless. So human resources will always be scarce. And so we're always dealing with what? Trade-offs. We're dealing with trade-offs. And so when, when you're dealing with trade-offs, you're helping to map each choice the client make, makes to an outcome. And it might be a financial outcome. It might be a utility outcome. It might be just whether or not some one thing makes them happier than another thing. But we're constantly mapping choices to outcomes. And, the, and by developing that map, we allow clients, we, we facilitate clients making better decisions. 
defaults, so defaults recognizes the power, the fundamental deep power among human beings of inertia and the status quo bias or the status quo heuristic. Default choices will always be incredibly powerful and so you need to think about what, what, the, what the ideal outcome is going to be when you're structuring, a, when you're architecting uh, uh, sort of a, any kind of a choice structure in order to understand which kind of defaults you want to set up in that structure. Just as was the case in the prior example with Germany and Austria, obviously the defaults there led to powerfully different outcomes. Giving feedback. People, human beings, do best when they get regular feedback. When they can see when, they can see when they're doing well and when they can see when they're doing poorly. But feedback is an incredibly part of any structure. If you give people feedback and they know they're, going, they're doing well or doing poorly, they're hitting some boundary that they need to, come, need to pull back from, that allows them to act more powerfully as well. Expect error. People will make mistakes. People will make mistakes for all kinds of reasons, but mostly just because people make mistakes. You know, we tend to make decisions quickly, we tend to make decisions often for the wrong reasons, and it leads us down the wrong path. You need to have a system that, that takes into account the fact that people are going to make mistakes and can recover from that, that's robust enough to, to absorb mistakes. And finally, structuring complex choices. You know, when clients, you know, we think about, you know, when we're thinking about something which I'll talk about as an, as an extended example later, when we talk about something like the, uh, um, a, some system for safe withdrawal rates or a safe spending system, if you will, we see something that looks very straightforward. You know, we've done our research or we're, or we're borrowing from the research of others and we've determined that for a given portfolio under a given set of circumstances, this, this spending level is sustainable over the long run. But a client doesn't see that kind of a simple equation. They see something that is embedded in this dense thicket of other confusing stuff like a, a Eurozone crisis or a, or a Greek debt crisis or a fiscal cliff or any number of other things. And so they're looking at this dense thicket of, of complexity and the best thing we can do for them is to help structure their choices in the face of that complexity so they can see past the thicket of random variables that's confusing them. So coming back to now policy-based financial planning as a form of decision architecture. This is something, um, I went back and found my, my uh, I don't know how many here you know, have, have ever seen the, the financial planning textbook. It was written by Hallman and Rosenblum, but it's been, there have been times when it was a pretty central text. And when I was studying for the CFP exam back in the late 80s, uh, it certainly was a required text. And ever since, I think the oldest edition I could find that, that included this reference was 1975, there's a paragraph in there. And I found in my 1988 edition, I had actually highlighted this paragraph at the time, in which they talk about the notion of personal financial policies. And, and they give a very brief description and then they move on to other things. But the concept really, uh, I found it compelling at the time, it planted a seed that later came out in some joint work that Elisa and I did back in the early 2000s. So uh, I know you all remember the turmoil of the early 2000s. We had the dot-com meltdown in 2000, and then we had 9-11, and we, were, we found ourselves in a deep recession, and people were scared and anxious, and, and I was receiving, and Elisa was receiving, and everyone in this room who was practicing at that time was receiving a lot of anxious phone calls from clients saying, you know, our assumptions about the world prove not to be right. The world is unfolding in a way, you know, they didn't necessarily use those words, but the world was unfolding in a way that didn't seem consistent with our assumptions, and they were convinced that their financial plan had been blown up. So in order to try and calm them down, what we would do is we'd call them in and say, well, let's update your plan. Let's see how you're doing. And so they would, they would you know, we'd gather updated information, and, and we'd talk to them, and we'd, we'd crunch our numbers and revisit all elements of the comprehensive financial plan and lay it out for them and say, look, yeah, we've had a rough patch the last few years, but you're still basically on track. You know, it, it, it didn't move you as far as you thought it did. And they found that very comforting. They found that so comforting that pretty soon I had some clients who were asking for their annual update on a quarterly basis, um, which obviously is not, a very, not very time efficient for, for us as planners. Um, and, and so Elisa and I, in many long conversations, I think starting probably about, about 2002, um, 
started talking about better alternatives. You know, we knew there were these fundamental deep principles, and we started to revisit this concept of financial planning policies with this idea that perhaps you could take, you know, it's very similar to uh, investment policies in a way. I mean, investment policies represent a series of intentions and rules that you're going to follow in building, managing, and maintaining a, a portfolio in varying circumstances. And why do you have an investment policy? I can't remember who said this, because I know it wasn't me originally, but so I guess I don't have to give attribution since I can't. But, uh, but I remember someone years ago saying, you know, you, you would, it was probably Norm Boone and Linda Lubitz Boone. Actually, that's, that had to be where it, was, where it came from. Um, but anyway, the, um, the phrase that stuck in my mind was, you adopt an investment policy because it makes it easier to know what to do when it's hard to know what to do, right? It makes it easy to know what to do when it's hard to know what to do, when turn, things turn crazy. So there was this idea that if, if you could have this touchstone, which was a distillation of sort of best practices and, and um, a client's intents and all you've learned about their circumstances, if you could distill it down to like, a, to like these compact decision rules that could be a touchstone to keep them committed, then you wouldn't have to revisit the financial plan four times a year and crunch the numbers and you know, build this whole big edifice of, a, of a, a sort of a standard classical financial plan. So, and it turns out with 2020 hindsight that what we were really talking about was decision architecture. These are decision rules. These are rules that say what the client is going to do under any given set of circumstances. And as the external circumstances change, the rules give them the feedback they need. So this is what I loved about Thaler and Sunstein's work. It's like it, it, took, it took this thing that, that had emerged organically and intuitively and proved to be really effective in working with clients. And it gave it, it sort of gave it a behavioral finance underpinning that the motivations that we were already reacting to, you know, we can now, we can now sort of, speaking of mapping, we can now map these back to the literature on behavioral finance. So policies can be very confusing sometimes um, because there's lots of pieces that surround them uh, but that are distinctly different. You know, they're not beliefs and values, although beliefs and values give rise ultimately to policies. And they're not action items, although action items flow from policies. They're not implementation items. They're not steps someone's going to take. You know, they're not goals and aspirations, although those things are all inputs into policies. And it can be very easy, you know, or sometimes our students uh, in our capstone course will be, will be incorporating policies into their plans and, they, and they'll, slip into the, they'll slip into crafting a policy that's really just a series of action items. And, and I'll show you in a minute why that's not a policy. So here's an example. Now, someone might have a belief that too much inheritance blunts ambition. I think we've all heard, and I don't know if it's original with him. I've seen things since that make me think maybe it wasn't. Uh, but we've all heard the, the uh, Warren Buffett phrase when someone said to him, uh, how much money should you leave your kids? And he said, you should leave them enough to do anything, but don't leave them enough to do nothing. Um, and it's very common. We all experience it with our clients. You know, they worry about whether or not leaving too much money to their kids or their grandkids is going to ruin them is going to leave them you know, unambitious and not making their way in the world and making their own mark on the world. And so a lot of people hold that belief. Well, a goal might be you know, to, to say, okay, well, we want to use our resources, you know, myself and my spouse want to use our resources to support each other, but we don't want to leave a big inheritance to our kids. So we might adopt a policy that says, you know, we're going to use life insurance only to meet our, to, to, to fill any gaps in our capital needs for each other but not to leave any kind, of a, any kind of a legacy. So the natural action that would flow from that would be, that's fine, we'll buy life insurance based on a capital needs analysis, but the, the contingent beneficiaries are going to be charities. Another example, and I actually, we have a client who, for whom this is true. When you give money to charitable causes, I always like to say, you are, you are making the first of two gifts. Because the second gift occurs when they sell your name to a mailing list. <laughs> we all know that when, when we ourselves or when our clients start to become more active charitably, all of a sudden the charitable network for all sorts of causes starts to become aware of our existence and the appeals and the pleas start to pile up. And they can be very stressful. Fending off appeals because most charitable causes 
are engaged in really good work, right? I mean, you hear what they're doing, you think, ah, oh, that's great. Oh my God, I'm going to feel like a bad person if I don't support their work. Um, and so it could become very, very stressful at the end of the day to fend those off. So having a, having a policy can be a very powerful way to do it. In this particular case, this client, was, she was very scattershot in terms of her giving because she was sort of, she was prone to feeling bad when some, you know, she said no to someone, so she was saying yes to everyone. But at the end of the day, we sat down and we, and we did some deep discovery um, with respect to her charitable goals, her, her, sort of what she, where she wanted to make her most impact in the world. And it turned out that she had this really deep belief that, that you know, preschool, preschool enrichment programs, you know, she had seen the research that said preschool enrichment programs have a huge, or a huge predictor of later success in life, later educational success and career success and so forth. So she thought this really, for, for whatever reason, she found that that really compelled her. So she wanted to focus her charitable giving on that. And so we ended up crafting a policy, a sort of a two-part policy. There's two filters to this policy. It basically says, I will, and there's sort of another set of decision rules around safe withdrawal rates that feeds into this one. Uh, policies can sometimes become interlinking, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. But the first one was, I will devote 10% of my then safe withdrawal target for the given year, which of course changes, I will devote 10% of my then safe withdrawal target to charitable giving, and I will focus all of my charitable giving on preschool enrichment programs. So now it becomes, it, and it has been her experience, that it's so much easier when someone, when someone makes an outreach for her to just ask a few questions. First of all, to determine whether or not this cause is consistent with her focus. And if it's not, she could say, thank you very much, this sounds like a worthy cause. You're clearly doing good work in the world, but I've made a decision to focus all of my activity because I believe, it's like impact investing, right? She said, I believe I want to have an, a, a particular impact in the world, and so I focus on preschool enrichment programs. You don't fall into that category, but you know, be well. I, I know you're doing good work, work in the world. If they pass that first filter, if they make it through past that first part of the policy, then the second is, oh, well, you know, my target for giving this year is $22,000. And I'm afraid I've already given that much. See me again next year. Or, oh, she's, she's only given $16,000. She'll say, well, let's talk some more. But it's been so effective. And it, it automatically adjusts. It has the characteristics that we'll talk about more in a minute. It, it deals with, as her, as her safe withdrawal targets changes, the policy absorbed that change without us having to go re-crunch the numbers and see what she can afford to give now and in the future. Um, and it gives her, and it also embeds her beliefs in a way that allow it to act as a very um, potent touchstone. So when we're talking about policies, we have sort of a two-part test that we apply. Because again, policies are meant to be adaptable, to meant to, to return answers in a changing, chaotic world, to be a touchstone. So the first question we have to ask is, is it a policy? And the next question, because as I said, sometimes it's something else. Sometimes it's a belief or a goal or an action item. Uh, and the second test is, is it a good policy? So is it a, it, the question, is it a policy, is answered pretty readily by, by just quickly asking yourself, as external cha circumstances change, does this policy return different answers? And if the answer is no, then it's probably an action item or something like that. You know, if, if someone says, my policy, is to put $1,000 a year into an education account. Well, OK. What, under what circumstances would that change? It's $1,000 a year. Never changes. So that's actually more of an action item. Uh, if someone said, you know, I'm committing to putting some, give, some percentage of my then income into, you know, allocated towards education or something else, well, that's the beginnings of a policy, because as one's income changes over time, that policy is, is returning different answers. So the next question is, is it a good policy? The dual characteristics of a good policy are, is it broad enough to encompass any conceivable circumstance that might arise? Because a policy is not much of a touchstone if something, something happens in the world and the policy doesn't encompass that thing. It can't, can't return an answer. To, so is it broad enough to encompass anything that might happen in the world, and at the same time capable of, re of returning a clear, unambiguous answer each time? 
So any policy to be an effective touchstone, to be something that clients could actually embrace, believe in, and take comfort in, has to satisfy that dual criteria. Here's another example. Um, and it's a debt management example. So it's a three-part policy. The first part says, we will use credit cards for convenience only. And we will only use credit, which, which means we will only use credit cards for spending items that are part of the monthly budget. If they're part of the monthly budget, we can pay off the credit card. Second, for any expenditures that aren't part of our regular monthly budget, but that are less than 10% of our annual income, we will accumulate savings on a monthly basis until we've accumulated enough to make that purchase. And the third part is, for anything that is more than 10% of our annual earnings, we use amortized debt. And you could have a you, know, you could have something further. I've heard some people suggest in, in the case of this policy, oh, maybe the third part would be um, we'll use amortized debt but only for appreciating assets or something like that. But um, then that means that you could never finance a car. You, I think the idea when that was suggested was, well, you'd only use it to buy real estate. But that was prior to, that was prior to 2008. So uh, anyway, this, is, this satisfies, first of all, is it, is it a policy? I mean, as I'm facing, as I'm facing new buying decisions, are, are I'm, am I getting different? Is it actually delivering different answers? And the answer is yes. At, secondly, is it a good policy? Does it encompass any conceivable purchase that I might be contemplating? And I think, again, the answer is yes. And third, does it, does it return clear, unambiguous answers? And again, I think the answer is yes. So if I'm faced with any given purchase decision, now there are a lot of things changing. I mean, the thing I'm contemplating purchasing is going to be different every day or every month. Um, my income is going to change over time. But as those changes take place, this policy still returns clear answers. You know, the first answer is going to be, um, I'm about to pull out my credit card. Is this, part of my, is this part of my monthly, normal monthly budget? If the answer is yes, it's like, okay, use your credit card. If the answer is no, it's like, put your credit card back in your wallet. And so on. So this is another example of a policy. It's very simple to understand, very straightforward, and anybody can apply it because anybody can answer the three, the three or four questions that they have to answer in order to stay within the bounds of this policy. So now we get into the whole idea of how do you craft policies? How do you actually begin? How do you become a decision architect? Well, the first step in the process, when you've put on your hat as decision architect, is to really engage in deep discovery. And I know everyone in this room does that. Everyone in this room does good discovery. And good discovery is crucial because the only way you can, you can craft a policy that is going to be effective is if, the, first of all, is if the clients see themselves reflected in that policy. They have to own it. Nothing is a touchstone unless you feel like it's really yours and really connected to you, right? And based on, the, you know, the, the, based on Cam's presentation at lunch yesterday, you know, perhaps this is really going to be especially important with Gen X, right? They've got to see how this connects to them and how this is reflective of their lives. You also, you know, just because this is like, this is akin to, to Thaler and Sunstein's notion of a nudge um, or, or uh, Stuart Heller's notion of, of the bureaucracy of habits and the fact that you need to use jujitsu, you can't fight against them, good discovery allows you to un uncover how your clients think. What biases do they have? What heuristics are they in the grip of? Like my, my Apple-owning client. Um, I haven't yet quite crafted the pol I haven't quite crafted policies that this person can embrace. So I'm, that's an ongoing process. But uh, more often than not, the process is success successful. But we have to do a good enough discovery process to not only learn what matters to them, but to get some kind of insights into what their mental map is. What biases do they have? And you know, these all come from their history with money and their family history and how they were raised, and as well as some of the ones that we all have just by virtue of you know, being at the end of 100,000 years of human evol of, of the evolution of mo the modern human brain. Obviously, we're at the end of a much longer chain of, of being than that. Um, but anyway, so good discovery gives us insights into what matters to them, what kind of heuristics and biases they might be particularly subject to, 
And we can use those then to begin to think about what kind of a decision architecture we're going to carry out. Now, policies tend to be related to topics or, or issues that people have to, have to deal with. And what are those issues? They're financial planning issues. So people will, you know, will typically craft policies related to risk management. Risk management, because you know when it comes to risk management, there's not one way to go. You know, you might have some clients who have the wherewithal and the desire to retain most of the risk for certain, in certain situations, and others that would much rather shift it to a third party. And so um, we've, you know, we have lots of different ways in which we can structure these. But it's an area where people have to make decisions. The uses of debt, cash flow policies. I'll get, again, I'll give more examples as we go forward. But you have to identify the relevant area, the relevant financial planning area in which you're trying to craft a policy. And in doing so, you have to think about, you know, what are the best practices here? What are the best practices when it comes to debt management? What are the best practices when it comes to risk management or saving for retirement? Now, best practices might vary. I'm sure that if we had made this into a colloquium and we spent the next couple of hours talking about, you know, how to buy long-term care insurance or when to buy it or how to structure it, we would have a diversity of opinions that would emerge in this room. You know, as a profession, there's, there's some, I almost said wiggle room, but there's, there's room for a variety of best practices around many of the things that we deal with. But nonetheless, each of us presumably has established and adopted a best practice for ourselves when we're, giving, when we're advising clients. Now hopefully those best practices are as much as possible evidence-based, based on the best available research. When it comes to financial planning, our body of knowledge is still a little thin on formal academic research, and hopefully that will get better with the passage of time. But whatever the best available evidence is, hopefully we're harnessing that, deciding what the best practice is, and then bringing that to play. Then the next step is we've taken what we know about the clients, we've taken what we know about their particular um, way of seeing the world and their biases and the heuristics that they're most prone to, and we've taken the financial planning best practices, and now we're going to distill those down into a handful of simple decision rules. And this is one where we're going to take the first shot at it, um, and we're going to try and have, and we're going to, and we're going to test it. We're going to ask, we're going to answer those two questions. Is it a policy? Is it a good policy? Do things actually change? I mean, when, when things change, does the policy change? Does, it, does the policy return new, fresh answers? And is it, is it a good policy? Is it broad enough to encompass any circumstance? And at the same time, always deliver a clear answer. Scenario planning is a good way to play with that. Just imagine different things happening. You know, what if this happens in the economy? What if this happens in the tax laws? What if this, you know, what if some, there's some change in a person's life? They have another child born or another grandchild is born. Uh, they get married or they get divorced. I mean, you could throw any number of scenarios in and see if, if the policy is able to encompass those and is always returning clear answers. And finally, and this is the, this is, well, not finally, but this is where it really starts to get interesting, is you sit down with clients and you start to, and you start to actually share these with clients in a provisional way. Um, Sandra Davis, who's a good friend of ours, uh, I think was the first one I heard say this, but although I, I think uh, Holly, and, Holly Gilling Kindle at Mosaic also uh, has adopted this approach of actually proposing maybe a couple of alternatives, a couple of alternative policies. And it's always best if you incorporate you know, the, the, the client's own words into the policies, because that really helps them feel connected to it, feel like it's really crafted for them. But at, you might propose a couple of different policies and say, you know, which one of these seems to resonate most? Which one of these feels most like what you mean when, we, when you talk about this or what you would like to accomplish in your life in this area? And let them choose one. And maybe even do a little wordsmithing until they feel like they can own it, until they feel like it's really their policy. And, you know, as Elisa likes to say, she's, she's had a number of instances where clients, she'll be talking to clients on the phone or in a meeting, and they'll be grappling with some new situation that's arisen, and the client will literally say, I think we need a policy around this. Um, so it is, for those of you who have been using it, I think you've seen, it, it's a concept that clients actually will and, and can and will embrace. Um, you, just like in the financial planning process, there has to be some, you know, periodic review. The thing is that 
policies are meant to be a durable and enduring guide in the midst of changing or even chaotic circumstances in the outside world. But they can change. They can change if there's fundamental change. You know, if there's a fundamental change to financial planning best practices around a particular policy, we would want to incorporate that fundamental change into an updated policy. If there's been a fundamental change with the client, if the client, again, Elisa likes this example, you know, she'll, she'll suggest that maybe the client who was afraid that inheritance blunts ambition and wanted to make sure that when they were gone, everything went to charity, the first time they hold their grandchild in their arms, they maybe start to think, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I do want to provide some support down through the generations. Well, that, that could be a fundamental shift in the way they, their belief system. You'd have to go back and update their policy to reflect that fundamental shift. So, I, you know, we have to think that policies are good in all circumstances with all different kinds of clients. Um, you know, it's funny because I, 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 we, we talk a lot about the fact that it could be very useful with younger people because a lot of times most of the stuff they're dealing with is cash flow related and many of the decisions they're going to have to make have not yet arisen in their lives. And so if you can get them to adopt good policies now, then it makes it much easier for them to make good decisions as those circumstances arise. But I, you know, I, was, I, I remember talking to uh, uh, a colleague of all of ours, Casey Gott, one time, and he said, oh, no. He said, policies for me are most powerful with the wealthiest people who come in to our office, either as clients or prospective clients. He said, because he'll talk about charitable giving policies and policies related to legacy and dealing with family members, and those really, re really resonate with those clients. So it really is relevant across the board, large clients, small clients, young clients, old clients. Um, you know, again, the... Uh, uh, it, we've, we've had a lot of, I think I've already sat in four presentations at least that have incorporated, you know, the notion of the, uh, how the different generations interact with the world. But one thing that seems pretty clear around the, especially with Gen X and Gen Y, is they really need to see themselves as, as much as anyone, they need to see how it relates, may, and maybe more, as, been, as Cam was suggesting, they need to see how it relates to their lives. So this is, this could be very powerful if, it's, if you do it in a way that's highly personalized. Um, so here's an example of a cash flow policy. You know, again, this, is, this could be useful with anyone, um, but especially with people who, who are younger people starting out, where, you know, they, we have to take sort of a bucket approach. They have finite resources and a number of things that they need to take care of. And so you need to actually set a series of priorities. And this is where, again, where policies, you can create what we like to call cascading policies where the policies tell you what's going to happen to the, what the, what the priorities are with respect to the first dollar, the next dollar, the next dollar, the next dollar, knowing that you can't finance everything you, or that person, this maybe this young person, um, is not in a position to finance everything we know, we know they need to do. So we set up a series of cascading policies that, that, that will prioritize and tell them, you know, the first thing you need to do right up front, emergency fund. You need some cash reserves. So every dollar of savings you can accumulate goes there until you've accumulated, choose a number. It could be uh, three months worth of, you know, if, let's say they, they have some kind of a uh, disability plan at work that kicks in after three months. So we, you determine they need three months worth of living expenses. Well, if they're saving 10% of every paycheck, that's the first place it's going to go. And this is a, again, this is a case where this is a policy because it changes. Their living expenses change, and as their living expenses change, well, first of all, their, their income changes. So as their income changes, that 10% is constantly going to be changing. Their living expenses change, so that emergency fund target is going to be constantly changing and, and adapting. But it prioritizes that. And then next, they're going, to, they're going to let it flow into their employer retirement plan, up to the maximum there. And then it's going to flow into an opportunity fund, or a fun fund, or a vacation fund. But you, you know, it doesn't, it's going to vary by each individual, because each individual has different goals and propensities. But you can set the priorities in a very straightforward way. And you, you know, it's, Again, I know that everyone here has dealt with the whole notion of buckets, right? And policies can be structured just like buckets. There's a priority, and you know where it's going to go. And, you, and, and it also is really good for dealing with windfalls. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, you know, windfalls, are, um, windfalls are an interesting moment in, in anyone's life. Um, and a windfall could be a, it could be a, 
a tax refund, and we know some people love tax refunds for all the wrong reasons. Um, and or it could be a bonus, it could be a raise, it could be an inheritance. But one of the things that Kahneman and Ariely and Thaler and Sunstein and, and all the others talk about when they talk about, in, you're talking about people's behavioral biases is that human beings underestimate the impact of, of decision making. I, I think the term is while aroused. Now, you know, that, that, that could be applied to a lot of different realms of life, but it certainly applies to financial decisions. You know, when that bonus check, when that net bonus shows up in your paycheck, you know, you're under a state of arousal, and, and, and if you wait till then to decide what you're going to do with it, you're probably going to head off to Las Vegas or Hawaii or God knows what else, but you're going to do something that you've been wanting to do, and, and, and you've just been waiting for the opportunity, and suddenly, this is free money. So having policies in place ahead of time where it's predetermined, a decision doesn't have to be made. The decision has been made when you weren't under that state of arousal. That, that's one of the areas where it could become very powerful. Um, Thaler and Bernatzi developed this um, Save More Tomorrow program that's very similar and it incorporates some, you know, these heuristics in a very interesting way. Now, they came up with a program in which they, they would propose that individuals would commit to saving more money in the future. They would save, when, as they got pay raises, they would save a portion of those pay raises. And they found that, they actually did an experiment where they, they went in and did this with, a, with like a middle-sized manufacturing company. And um, they sat all the employees down. That, well, they, they offered the employees the opportunity to sit down with a, with a financial advisor. And most of the employees took advantage of that. And what the advisor did is, is talk to them, uh, determine what, how much they were earning and how much they were saving and when they wanted to retire, and came back to them with a number. And because so, nobody was saving enough, right? Is anybody ever saving enough? Uh, and so they came back with them, to them with a number. And they'd say, you know, you need to increase your savings rate by 5%. You know, someone was putting, someone was putting 4% in. I think in, in this instance, the company was matching up to 4%. So there were a lot of people putting, of those who were participating, a lot were putting in 4%. And so they'd come back and say, you need to put in 5% or you need to put in another 6%. And they found there were some people who would commit right on the spot, fine, 5%. It was a small number. It was maybe 20% of the people who needed to save more, 26%, I think it was, uh, actually agreed to up the number by 5% or whatever it was. And of the 60 some odd percent of the, you know, and then I guess if it was 26, it was actually more like 74, but uh, of, the, of the 74% who didn't, weren't willing to do that, weren't, because of loss aversion, they weren't willing to see their paycheck shrink. They said, okay, well, how about this? How about you, every time you get a raise, you up your savings automatically by 3%. And in this company, the raises had all been running like three and a quarter to 4%. That had been kind of a typical range for raises. And interestingly, something like 67% out of that, out of that 74% agreed. They said, because you know, as it, it, in terms of the, the behavioral biases, it wasn't, it's always easier when, when you're dealing with self-restraint problems, it's always easier to commit to something that violates your, you know, your, your, that, that goes against your inability for, to, in, to uh, uh, practice self-restraint if it's in the future. And there's no loss aversion because my paycheck's not going down. And it kind of taps into money illusion because you know, when people are redirecting their pay to savings, their, their nominal income actually isn't going up. But, but people have money illusion. People don't think in inflation-adjusted terms. So as long as that nominal paycheck is staying the same, they're okay. Um, and it also, once it was in place, it, it uh, capitalized on their tendency towards inertia. So the interesting outcome was something like four and a half years later, they went back and they looked, and what they found is that the, the, you know, the people who were at 4% because that was the match and they committed to go to 5 they were still at 9% of their pay on average going into the retirement plan. The people who refused to make the increase on the spot but who committed to the Save More Tomorrow program, on average, they were saving 16.3% of their paycheck. 
So, you know, that, again, that just shows the power of setting these things up and the power of doing it in a way that leverages off of people's natural biases. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we find incredibly powerful, uh, where we find policies to be incredibly powerful, is um, in dealing with contingent resources. There is um, one of the things that comes up in financial planning a lot is that someone is in a situation where, well, you know, I've got company shares in this startup and I don't know what they're going to be worth, you know, or I've got options and someday I can exercise these if they're ever worth anything. I don't know what they're going to be worth. Or I'm anticipating a bonus or a series of bonuses, but I, it's not guaranteed. I don't know how big it's going to be, uh, but it's somewhere down the line. Maybe I, I'm going to have, maybe I'm going to have a bonus. Uh, or, or, you know, my mom's got some money. She's not doing that well physically, but I, I just, I don't know how much she has, and I don't know if end-of-life medical expenses are going to eat it all up. But there might be, a, there might be a, an inheritance down the road. Well, these are things that we know exist. They, we can identify them as what I, what I like to call a contingent resource. It's a, it's a sort of, it's a resource, it's a theoretical resource that is contingent upon other things happening. We, we know it's there, we know it's in the landscape, we know it may, or in fact, it may, there may be a high probability it's somehow gonna come into play, but we cannot explicitly account for it in the plan right now. But we can develop policies around this. We can account for it in the plan, not by saying, well, let's assume that your mother dies in seven years and she leaves you $1.2 million. You know, obviously, none of us do that. But we could set up a policy, incorporate a policy in the plan that says something like, you know, this, whatever windfall, and you can name, the, what, the, you know, you can name what they are. If I receive an inheritance, when, my, when, I, when I cash in my shares, if I receive a bonus, I will do the following. And, and you just have a series of policies around saying, we're prioritizing based on the overall plan and your desires. We're structuring it away so it can change, and, it does, and we don't have to know in advance what the number's going to be, um, and we don't even have to know in advance what the need is going to be. You notice in this policy, it's structured as, first toward my granddaughter's, granddaughter's college fund, up to one half of then projected four-year cost. All right, well, we don't know what the, what the four-year cost is gonna be four years from now or six years from now, but this accounts for that. And likewise, next to my alma mater, up to 10% of my then annual earned income, I don't know when this, if this ever happens, I don't know what my income at the time is going to be, but this policy will return a clear answer. So it can be really powerful in dealing with contingent resources. And I just want to make a note, based on now a dozen years of really kind of trying to practice this a little bit with clients and doing, and, doing, and, and, and actually having, um, seeing colleagues do it. I mentioned Sandra Davis, she did a lot of work with lower income people where policies proved to be really powerful. Uh, and again, I mentioned Mosaic. I know that Holly Gillian Kindle, who's done some, we've done some work together at Golden Gate University, she, she uh, uh, did a lot of work in developing, in developing a framework for incorporating policies in the planning process. Um, and so I've had a chance to interact, to you know, have a personal experience and talk to colleagues who have, who have done this. And so I just want to make a statement that puts the policy, you know, policy-based financial planning in context. We're always dealing with people who live on some kind of a spectrum, right? We have the highly compliant people, you know, who Thaler and Sunstein might say are the econs, or the ones who are dominated by the econ side of their brain. Uh, we have the highly non-compliant people for whom, you know, woo-hoo, uh, if whatever resources show up in my lap, you know where it's going to go. It's going to be a trip to Las Vegas. And then we have a lot of clients who kind of work kind of quiet. They're sipping their chamomile tea, tea whatever. They're, they're somewhere in the middle. Um, and the thing with policies is, you know, it will shift everyone in a positive direction. It's not going to take the highly non-compliant person and turn them into an econ. That's just not going to happen. But what you will see is a little bit of a shift, a little bit of a shift in a, in a, in a positive direction, in a, in, a dire in a healthier direction financially. Um, okay, so here's where I wanted to get into a, just a little bit of a, just analyze a, a policy um, using the Thaler and Sunstein, Sunstein uh, framework, which I think is kind of a useful framework. So uh, these are some safe, safe withdrawal, or what I'd like to call safe spending policies that were, that were based on work by uh, Guyton and Klinger. When it comes to safe withdrawal work, I, um, I know that probably a lot of you were in Michael Kitsis's session yesterday. 
which I had to miss because of a conflict, but uh, he was talking about the state of safe withdrawal. And so those of you, you know, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what he said, I suspect. Um, you know, a lot of this work started coming to our attention as financial planners back in the 90s when Bill Bangen started publishing some of, his, some of his analysis in the Journal of Financial Planning. And then there's the Trinity study, and there are a handful of, other, handful of others. But in, in the early days, they were, and isn't it kind of scary to think of the 90s as the early days? It, doesn't, it really wasn't that long ago, was it? Um, but in the early days of this particular work, people tended to take what I call a static approach. You know, Bill Bangan's approach was using the techniques of actuaries. You know, he looked at portfolios structured in different ways uh, in order to answer the following question. What's the highest initial withdrawal rate for a given portfolio that I can begin drawing in year one of retirement such that I can increase it by the inflation rate every single year over, and I think he was mostly working with 30-year time periods, over a 30-year retirement with a high confidence that I won't run out of money by, by the end of 30 years. And he came up with a number, or a couple of numbers, depending on the portfolio, the structure of the portfolio. What I love about the Guyton and Klinger work is they ask a slightly different, oh, they ask a significantly different question. What they were asking is, what's the highest initial withdrawal rate? What's the highest spending trajectory I can launch myself on for a given portfolio if, under well-defined circumstances, I'm willing to make certain changes along the way based on well-defined changes in external circumstances? So in, in, in essence, it's a perfect example of a policy. And when they first published their work in 2006, which happened to be the same year that Elisa and I first published in the journal on policies, uh, they were calling these decision rules. And uh, as a consequence of a lot of conversations and work since then, um, John always refers to them as, as uh, safe withdrawal policies. But we think it's a brilliant example because it, it satisfies all those, all those criteria. It is a, it's clearly a policy. It's clearly a good policy. It's broad enough to encompass any possible external changing circumstances, and it always delivers a clear answer. So um, if we think about the Thaler and Sunstein sort of fundamental six elements of choice architecture, we can, we can apply this. Now, we took it in, the, in terms of how we incorporated their work into our practice. Um, you know, we did a couple of things. We did add an element where we determine the initial withdrawal rate partly as a function of market conditions at that time. But we, what we did is we, we took the rules and we built them into a tool that we share with clients. And it becomes a part of our annual review. And this is what it looks like. Uh, you probably can't read this. Oh, and by the way, I meant, to, I meant to let you know and also apologize in advance that you will see some slides that are not in the handouts but I, I, I will upload the updated slides so you'll have all of those when you get your disk. Or I, I think maybe you end up downloading it from the website. Anyway, however you get the slides, the next iteration of the slides, they, they will be these slides. Um, so this, I built a spreadsheet. One day I was on an airplane. I used to, I still spend a lot of time on airplanes, but I, but I was always coast to coast, so I always had like five or six hours to work with, which was kind of nice. And I thought, OK, so we really need to implement this in a, in, a, in a practical way. And so I built a spreadsheet that just took into account what do we think the current market conditions are, high, medium, low valuation, and then that would spit out an initial withdrawal rate. Well, it, actually, there's two parts. Is the market high, medium, or low valuation? Is the portfolio high, medium, or low equity allocation? And then the combination of those two things would spit out an initial withdrawal rate. And then we had the three decision rules that were part of that policy. I didn't actually go over them. Um, it has three elements. There's an inflation rule that says every year on the anniversary. This is the, th the other thing I like about this particular set is it has dynamism. And it's the dynamism that actually is, you know, gives it its power. Because instead of the 3 or 3.5% three initial withdrawal rate, you know, this off, you know, under this approach, the research they did suggests that you, you know, 5.5%, maybe even under some conditions, 6% initial withdrawal rate might conceivably be sustainable, but it's only if you're willing to incorporate that, that dynamism. So you can, you can launch yourself on a higher spending trajectory if you're willing to make some adjustments along the way. So that's, so that's one piece. Um, so anyway, so on the, but there's also stability. 
because these rules only get applied once a year. So there's dynamism and stability. And, and interestingly, you know, this answer, because this really answers a question that Michael Kitsis, for example, was asking. I remember being at a conference up on the podium spouting off about something, you know, a decade ago, and he asked a question about, well, what about safe withdrawal rates when market conditions have changed and you've got two people who both had a million dollar portfolio and one of them starts, you know, one of them retires and is drawing 40,000 a year and a year later when the market's dropped by 20%, the second one retires, you know, and they're only drawing $36,000 a year. How, how do you explain that? Because they both started with the same portfolio. Well, you know, I've run, I've run the, sim the simulations with these and that totally accounts for it. What happens is the, the applications of these rules cause those two people to converge. The, the one who started out at the high point of the market, they end up having the, the capital preservation rule kick in and they take a, you know, they'll take a 10% cut. And the person who started out at the low point, because they started at a low point with a lower withdrawal rate on the upswing, their portfolio will grow faster in re relation to their spending, their target spending, and so they'll get the, the prosperity rule, they'll get the increase, and they'll begin to converge. But anyway, so the three rules are inflation rule, every year on the anniversary, you get an a, a, a increase equal to the CPI for the last 12 months, as long as your portfolio has had a positive return and or your current spending, your current spending as a percentage of the portfolio is below your initial withdrawal rate as a percentage of the portfolio. Capital preservation rule says that if the portfolio is a consequence of a market downturn, if a portfolio has fallen in value sufficiently that your target spending is now 20% bigger as a percentage of the portfolio than when you started. You know, so if you started out with 5%, if it was a million dollar portfolio and, and you started out with uh, uh, a 5% withdrawal rate, $50,000 a year, and your portfolio falls to $833,000, all of a sudden now that, that same spending, that same $50,000 is 6% of the portfolio, 6% is 20% bigger than 5%, triggers the capital preservation rule. For the next year, your target spending is gonna be reduced by 10%, and then the mirror image of that is the um, prosperity rule. If that same million dollar portfolio has grown to a million and a quarter, that $50,000 of spending is only 4% of that portfolio. 4% is 20% smaller than your initial withdrawal rate of 5%. You get a 10% increase, a prosperity increase. I remember when I had John uh, doing a guest lecture with one of our financial planning classes, and, and he was saying, when he was talking to Bill Klinger about these, he said, I don't care what we call the, this rule, but it, the acronym has to be CPR. Like, <laughs> this, is the one that, this is the one that resuscitates the portfolio. But anyway, so this is... This, so this, it's a very dynamic, it's a very beautiful example. And now let's look at it in terms of Thaler and Sunstein's principles. Incentives, understand mapping, defaults, give feedback, expect error, structure complex choices. So anyway, so back to me on an airplane. Um, I said, okay, so I'm gonna build a spreadsheet where I can have these inputs and it will, and then as I change the, you know, every year we plug in, you know, here's the, the new value of the portfolio, here was the 12 month return, the trailing 12 month return, and here's the trailing 12 month CPI, and it automatically applies the three rules and tells us what the new target spending is going to be. And what I discovered at the time when I was doing this, not that, I don't know what, how many years ago it was now, but anyway, the version of Excel, I, I learned at the time the limits of how many nested if-then statements you could have. I think my limit at the time is you couldn't have more than 29 nested if-then statements, um, which was like one if-then statement short of really what I needed, but, uh, but that, that's changed since then, so it's not a problem. So it resulted in this, in this, this is a spreadsheet, it, I don't know how, it, we try and make it not look too much like a spreadsheet, but, and so the top part shows how we, you know, where the initial withdrawal rate comes from, and uh, you know, you could see that we changed the portfolio value in the next section. 12-month portfolio return, 12-month inflation, and then it applies the three rules and spits out a new return. So in terms of incentives, what's the incentive here? I mean, the incentive structure is very clear. If you're willing to, A, commit to a certain kind of portfolio, you know, one that's 30% equities, and, or pardon me, 30%, 70% uh, equities instead of 60 or 50, um, then that's going to impact your initial spending level. Second, if you're willing to adopt the system and really adopt it and live within it, it's going to it's going to launch you on a higher spending trajectory than otherwise. Um, in terms of mapping, I think it very clearly maps the choices and consequences. 
you know, as you change the portfolio structure. Or for that matter, if, if someone's not willing to adopt this, if they say, no, 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 I don't think I could, I don't think I, yeah, the, you know, the initial spending level looks fine, but I don't think we could reduce it by 10%. Okay, then we go back to the static approach, and you really only have a 3% initial withdrawal rate. Now, how are you, can you live with that? I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 by the way, just as a side note, it's interesting in how it informs your conversations with clients strategically. This is wonderful, but it only really works if, someone, if, if the, the structure of someone's budget has a, has a significant amount of discretionary spending in there, right? If, someone, if, if someone's, you know, if, they're, if their safe spending target is such that it's all fixed expenses, the system's not going to work. It's, not, it's either not going to work or it's going to be really painful. And of course, that's, not, that's also not going to work. Um, and so, I, you know, I've had a case just on that note. I had a case where some clients came in and they sat down in front of me and they said, you know, we love the Highlands Inn down in Carmel. And I said, I love it too. That's where Elise and I went on our honeymoon. It's a beautiful place. And they said, we love it so much, we go every year. We go there for two or three weeks. It's fantastic. And this is a, it's a I think it's a Hyatt property, right? Anyway, it's a Hyatt property. And they're, they're doing a, a program where they're offering fractional ownership. And we sat down and did the numbers with someone. And, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars to buy in. And then there's maintenance expenses and so forth. But we ran the numbers. And it looks like it would cost maybe a little bit less than what it's costing us to go up there for two weeks or three weeks every year as we're doing now and just rent a room. Well, I, I observed. I, I think under a, with a given set of circumstances that analysis might be accurate. It might be that for a given, you know, under those very specific circumstances, it's costing you a little bit, a little bit less. But what that analysis does not take into account is the flexibility you're giving up. It's like an option. Flexibility has a value. It, it, again, it's very much like an option analysis. And I fear that sometimes, as, even as financial planners, certainly members of the public, you know, non-financial planners, but I think sometimes even as financial planners, we don't, we don't often enough incorporate the value of the flexibility, the value of the option in our analysis. And this is a case where flexibility had a value. And it had a value in this context. And I talked to them about it along those lines, and they said, Okay, you know, that actually makes sense. We'll just keep renting. Um, so anyway, the, the other piece, the other thing is that we set up defaults as much as possible. I mean, we're telling them what they can spend. We're, you know, typically we're doing what you all do. We're, you know, you set it up like the, the, the retirement paycheck, right? Goes straight into their, goes straight into their, their uh, checking account once or twice a month. Um, Try and, have it, try and have them out of the loop as much as possible. But, in ter but it also gives feedback. And this is actually one of the things that we started doing. Um, I can remember after the dot-com melt, and pardon me, no, not the dot-com melt, after the, uh, the real estate meltdown, I hope I don't have to have another set of meltdowns I have to talk about at some point. Uh, yeah, I, th I fear you're correct, Linda. Um, after the real estate meltdown, I can remember having some clients come in and I was saying, you have to spend less. You know, you've taken a huge hit to their portfolio, your portfolio, which they were well aware of and they were very unhappy and they were frightened and they were anxious. And I said, you really got to spend less. You've got, this is what you can spend. And, and I said, and you've been, and the problem was that what I was telling them they could spend was like 5 or 10% less than what I'd been telling them they could spend the year before and the year before that and the year before that. The problem was that they had been spending 20% more than what I, could tell, I told them they could spend in those prior years. And so I wasn't asking them to, to take a 5 or 10% reduction. In their minds, I'm asking them to take a 25 or 30% reduction. And they were fussy about it, as you might imagine. And I pointed out to them, I actually pulled out the reports I'd done for the, lack of the last four or five years and said, look, you know, in each case, I'm telling you what, you know, I'm telling you what you could spend sustainably. Well, that's not what they were hearing. Because what was I doing? I was, at that time, I was actually running Monte Carlo. I was doing traditional, you know, traditional financial planning projections along with, a, you know, trying to achieve a 70% Monte Carlo success rate. And I was always coming back to them and saying, there's your sustainable spending target. That's your sustainable spending target. All they're hearing is sustainable spending target. They weren't, hearing the, the other, they weren't hearing the other side, which was, and you're spending more than that. 
And so this is why we incorporated this section, actual versus target withdrawals. This is, again, this is in the, in, in the interest of feedback, because it turns out feedback is very valuable. And you can see it shows last annual target 12,000 in this example. This is a, an example. In this example, prior 12 month annual withdrawals, 211,000. They get a circle X. And actually, this, this red circle X, we, could, we size those. And in the, it, we do. They, they're, they're either little or this one would, in, in reality, this one would be much, much bigger. Big red circle slash. Um, if they're at or below their, their target spending, they get a thumbs up. And the thumbs up gets bigger or smaller based on, yeah, you know, you, were, you got right to the last penny, or versus, wow, you only spent half of what your target was. And we focus on this. We focus on this. I mean, this feedback piece is big. I don't want any client to ever walk out of my office at, at their annual review not knowing that they're either doing good, maybe even could spend some more, or they're doing bad and they're on a bad, bad path. And it's red. And it's big. Um, so feedback is important. And, I, and I'm, I'm having different conversations. And yes, I will take a question. So the question from Don is, um, if, do we apply judgment if, if, the, if it's getting close to a decision rule, if it's getting close to triggering uh, one, of the, one of the three decision rules, do we maybe make a judgment and, and step in? I'm going to say no. We, we really, and I'm going to say no for a reason. Okay. I'm going to say no for a reason, because this is something that we found when we, we started implementing this in 2008. You know, this has been on our radar screen for a while, but, you know, between 2002 and 2000 and the end of 2007, um, things were going up. And, you know, we were pretty heavy on small caps and value, so they were actually, they were going up a lot. And it's, it felt le less uh, urgent to have something like this in place then. It's, by the end of 2008, that was not the case. And so we were implementing it, and what we found was with clients who are either existing clients, clients who are going into retirement in eight, 2008, 9, 10, or new clients who came in, they were anxious. You all lived it. You know, or may, in some cases, we're still living it, but you all lived it. You know what I'm talking about. And this gave them comfort. It gave them comfort because it was completely clear. They could understand it. It was unambiguously clear, and there were very few moving parts because it's structured. It was a case of structuring complex, you know, structuring complex choices. And I literally, this quote, I'm going to say it for the tape. I, had, I have this client who's, I'm just going to say, she's a very wealthy client. She's had a lot of, she's had financial advisors before they came to me. Um, and very, you know, working at big, supposedly sophisticated firms. And she said, for the past 35 years, financial advisors have been telling me how to put money into my portfolio. No one until now has made it clear how I can take money out of my portfolio. Now, let me say something about this, because we all have theories or, or, or best practices that we've adopted um, about how to get money out of portfolios. I mean, it's a safe withdrawal. There's a lot of other factors. There's tax management factors. I mean, there's a lot of elements to this, we all know. But a lot of what we deal with, we deal with it at a level of complexity at a level of technical complexity. The client interface has to be operating at a, t at a level of technical simplicity. We have to structure these complex decisions in a way that clients can connect to and feel confident about. And w the thing I have found universally is these make sense to clients. They know exactly when we're going to apply them. They know how we're going to apply them. They know exactly what's going to happen under, under, under sort of well-defined sets of circumstances that they can understand and follow. And it gives them comfort. It gives them comfort. And so I'm not, I'm not going to apply a judgment call. I mean, we, we set up the rules. We live by the rules. If we're getting close, we're getting close. Maybe the next time we meet, that trend continued and the rule gets triggered. Maybe before then, it's reversed. But the, we don't, we, we live within the rules for the sake of the clients. And they, they really 
really like it. And another question. So this, this, the question was, in this particular instance, um, you know, we have a, the, the policy, the target spending is 112,000, and, and, and the sample I put up, it shows the actual spending is 211. And, uh, you know, I did something crazy like that because I wanted to be able to show the circle slash thing, the circle X. Um, but we are having conversations like that. We're doing interventions when this happens. We're, we're you know, we're doing... We're going back into deep discovery mode and trying to find out what's, the, you know, what's going on underneath. I had an instance of, uh, let me structure this story to be properly uh, confidential, but I had an instance of a client who was just like this. And I sat down and said, you know, we've talked about this, this is not working. Oh, no, 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 I'm not spending that much. And so I pulled up the 12-month spending report and said, look, there it is. And ended up having the conversation about, you know, that there was maybe something driving the spending that was, that, that went beyond finances. And, uh, you know, and she totally embraced it and said, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And that, I mean, and then I went so far as, far as to say, you know, it might be that there's something else at work here that, that a, you know, that a counselor could, could help with. And um, ended up, she ended up going into counseling to work on that and, and, there's another part of that story in that, in that, like immediately after going into counseling, she found out she had a, she, she had a medical issue. And it turned out that being in counseling at that moment in time, because of the shock of the medical issue, was hugely valuable. But anyway, so that, that's a case. And there have been much milder cases. We've had other cases where we directed people to counseling. And they came out of it, you know, having, having sort of resolved some issue that was causing them to, causing their behavior to sort of subconsciously or unconsciously spin out of control. Most clients, not all, most clients, if you give them feedback, they will find ways to adapt. Because when, when it's like this, we actually get into the cash flow, right? This is a case where the key driver in this, in this financial planning situation, the key driver is cash flow. You have to burrow into the cash flow and find out what's possible and what's not possible and what changes they can make if they're, you know, in some cases it's just like wild discretionary spending and sometimes those are where you have to deal with it at a psychological level. And in other cases they've structured their life inappropriately. And you have to, you have to work with them to teach them how to restructure or help them restructure their life into something that's sustainable. So sometimes we're the primary architects of the solution in terms of restructuring their cash flow and sometimes they are by restructuring their sort of their, their, uh, the, their emotional approach to spending. I don't know, I hope that answered the question, but. So, I, actually, I have a couple more examples, but we only have a few more minutes. I think I'd rather um, take questions or comments or, you know, does this resonate? Does this make sense? Yes. So the question was, I had made a reference to a 70-30 equity bond allocation, and uh, it, it, was I suggesting that that's something that I would actually consider doing for clients in retirement? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Now, it's not the only allocation we use, but this comes back to incentives and, and mapping choices to consequences. You know, if a client... For whatever reason, if, if because of risk tolerance or other circumstances, uh, a client ends up with a 60-40 or a 50-50, um, we have to map those choices to the concurrent consequences, and we believe that their sustainable spending level is going to be lower in that instance. But we will, yeah, we will go as high as a 70-30 in retirement. Um, we typically wouldn't go higher than that, and there are exceptions. Sometimes you have clients who have so much money, the amount they're spending is trivial in relation to the portfolio. If they want to be in an 80-20 portfolio, I'm, I'm good with that. But the way we think about it, and again, this also ties back to this, it's, it's integrated with this safe spending system in that 
our rebalancing pre-retirement is goes in all directions between equity asset classes between stocks and bonds you know back in March of 2009 pre-retirement clients we were selling bonds like mad and buying stocks because we're policy driven we're policy based just like everyone in this room is and of course that was the right thing to be doing it in March of 2009 but post retirement we change our, our rebalancing policies post retirement we still rebalance among the equity asset classes and when stocks are rising relative to bonds, we're still, we're still uh, rebalancing from stocks into bonds. But when stocks are falling relative to bonds, we do not go in the other direction. And the reason we don't go in the other, other direction is that we have, we have conceptualized and constructed our bond allocation to be a stable reserve of value, a stable pool, if you will. Because the other thing that we do is we, we, it, during a significant market, a cyclical market downturn, we're funding spending entirely out of the bond reserve. So uh, by having a minimum 30% for the typical client, that's a, that's a six to seven year bridge. Spending bridge to carry them through that cyclical downturn so they don't have to sell equity shares at depressed prices. You know, this last downturn was less than four years in it for the portfolios to be back to their prior levels. And so it, it, admittedly, seven years is intuitive. You know, when you look at economic data, a, a century is not much. A century is not a very long period of time. You know, I mean, most, in most fields, you need a lot more data points than that, so there's always a certain amount of judgment that comes into play. But at least in, this, in the worst downturn you know, since the Great Depression, seven years was enough. But anyway, so that's the long answer. The, the, the point is, is that yes, we will. Um, we insist on it being at least 30%, except under rare circumstances, because we want to have at least a six or seven year bridge. And what we find is that's another source of, com of comfort to clients. Is it, you know, if, if they say, well, isn't the market getting kind of high? Aren't you worried about a reversal? Or, you know, if someone on the TV said that we're, we're heading for a correction, it's like, well, you care. If we go into a correction, you got seven years worth of spending before we have to worry about that. Um, seems to work, yes. So the question was, how and when do we incorporate? And when you say this, are you talking about all the financial planning policies or just the safe spending policies? All of them, right? Yeah, so we do this, we do this with, uh, so the question is when, I thought I'd said it. The question is, how and when do we incorporate policies in our work with, with existing or new clients? And the, the, the answer is right at the outset and continuously as needed. So, um, you know, we try and talk to we try and talk to clients. We try to incorporate appropriate policies into their financial plan right up front, and we revisit them as circumstances change or as new needs arise. Uh, and and we don't normally look at the safe spending policies until uh, until they enter retirement or they're on the cusp of retirement. Normally, if if someone's 30 years away from retirement, we're you know we're running traditional uh, traditional retirement projections. You know, supplemented with Monte Carlo simulations. Yes. So it would, um, I'm sorry, say that one more time. No, I heard the first part, but. That's a good question. Although, although this is becoming a colloquium on Guyton and Klinger safe withdrawal rules, but <laughs> the question was, if the portfolio dropped by 20%, the, it's actually 5.5, I think is the number, but it should be. Oh no, that's, that's the rate of the current withdrawal, and not the target withdrawal rate. But anyway, so the target withdrawal rate was 5.5, and um, if the portfolio drops, we don't apply that 5.5 to the now lower portfolio value. If it drops by enough to trigger the capital preservation rule, we reduce the target spending by 10%. So the $112,000 target would be reduced by 10%, by $11,200. So we apply the adjustments to the target spending, 
We don't, we don't just apply the percentage to whatever the portfolio is at the time. But the portfolio value will trigger those changes. But again, they get applied to, to, the, uh, and to the actual spending target. And I highly recommend going back to, you're all members of the Financial Planning Association, go to the journal archives, Guyton and Klinger, 2006. It's a great article. So the, the question is, once you've communicated these policies to clients, where do they reside? How do you, how do you communicate them to them? Um, this particular example, that, that's an example of a client private page, which is a, a private, secure, shared workspace on our website that each client has. Every client has a client private page. And we actually post everything there. Financial planning analysis policies, the, their annual spending policy update. We post it all there. In fact, when they come into our conferences, whether it's an initial plan presentation, a conference room, I should say, initial plan presentation or an annual update or anything in between, we have big monitors on the wall, and we bring up their client private page, and anything we've updated or any analysis we've done, it's posted there. And one of the things that does is it gets clients motivated to actually use it. You know, they'll, at some point in the meeting, they'll say, I have access to that? And it's like, yes, that's your client private page. You can go there anytime you want. So anyway, so that's how we communicate it. When do we decide what? So the question was, when do we not use policy-based financial planning with a client? What kind of client or under what circumstances? And I'm going to say, the more connected we are to clients, you know, the better we know them and the better they know us and the, the, the deeper our, and sort of the deeper our relationship, the more we're going to use policies and the more effective the policies are going to be. Um, and there are, there's sort of a spectrum. Most of our clients we really know well and they know us and, and, and we can really craft good policies and, and, and they're willing to adopt them. At the, you know, at the far end of the, opposite end of the spectrum, you have people who are just like asset management clients they came in that way. They were, you know, we normally don't take asset management clients, but sometimes we have reasons to do so. Maybe it's a 401k plan, but maybe, if it's someone's just an asset management client, likely other than an investment policy, we're not going to be dealing with policies. And, and then some people are just not as forthcoming as others, and sometimes they just they won't go th they won't go there. So if you can't learn enough about them to be able to craft a reasonable policy that they would reasonably be expected to embrace, um, it's not going to be effective. We try and do it with almost everyone. Um, and I'm going to say it works with, I'm plucking the number a little out of the air, 65, 70% of clients. Have you seen examples of where, where someone with a remote client initiated that process and brought them more into the fold or more like clients? You mean remote, like disconnected from us? Yeah. I, I, the question was with a, rem, with a client who's not very connected to us, a remote client, not physically remote, but maybe more Correct. relationship remote. Uh, does it help bring them into a closer relationship with us? And the answer is yes. It's yes. And I would say it's, it's yes for a couple of reasons. One, it's a, it's a process that begins with good discovery. And I think we all know that if you really do deep discovery, you're going to improve your relationship with your clients. And then it's an extension of that because you're also, you know, as, as you're crafting the policies, you're interacting with them to get it right and to make sure it reflects them and who they are and what they want. And so that's a process that absolutely deepens the relationship. I think we're almost out of time. Maybe one more, if there's. Yes. So the question is, how does it work in a multi-advisor uh, context? And uh, we're a little bit that way. We always work. First of all, we work in teams with clients. We have kind of a first chair, second chair. And you know, we also have multiple advisors who are dealing with different clients. Um, and I'd say it works well. It works well. Everybody gets to know the client better. If there's two of you in the room, you both get to know the client better. They get to know you better. Um, everybody has clarity. Though here's the thing we love about it. You know, we have some very young financial planners working for us. One of them is in the room who you met her at the outset. Um, they're all in their 20s. Jennifer, she's an old lady. She's 28. She's, I mean, our, our oldest financial planner, other than Elise and me, is 28. I guess Yusuf is 28 now too, right? And the youngest is 23. Um, 
In, okay, anyway, so they range from 23 to 28. They're very young. And um, as they develop and take on more and more responsibility as a financial planner, as an advisor, one of the stages they go through is a stage where they can operate sort of unsupervised if they're dealing purely on policy-based decisions. So the policies create a framework where um, everybody's on the same page, including maybe a younger advisor who's, who's developing into a, into a more experienced advisor. So that can be very powerful when anybody who's involved, whether it's the, the, you know, the second advisor on the team or anyone else in the firm, can reference the client's policies and respond to the client if the primary advisor is not around. And respond to them in a way that's hopefully going to, because it, again, it's because it's a distillation of everything we know about the client as well as our best practices, uh, it's in a way that, that, that in most cases resonates with the client. And I think that's it. I think we've run out of time. <laughs>